Hi guys and welcome to my channel. For this video, I'll be interviewing the songwriters called Moonshine and if you aren't sure what K-pop songs they have written, they have written for NCT Dream, for Red Velvet, for Ailey, for TXT, for Twice, for Wavy, for Super M, and so many more amazing artists. I have so many questions for them, so let's just dive straight into the interview. Please introduce yourselves and talk about what your musical background is. Hi, I'm Jonathan. Um, yeah, and I'm Ludwig. Yeah, we're, together we're Moonshine. We're a production team that been working like with K-pop for three years now. Yeah, three years. I guess like we come from same background, yeah. but at the same time not different backgrounds at all. I came from a, a family with like both my parents are like educated music teachers, so so I've been like Ooh. doing music since. Forever and all that. Yeah, um, we're beating the drums on the in the kitchen. You know that like the whole <laughs> cliche basically. Uh, yeah. But then got gone to multiple like music schools, more like pop and rock schools and stuff like that. Playing drums, playing trumpet, got to learn how to play like different instruments on a very basic level. But basically, a drummer. That's mm. where I come yeah. from, and metal and EDM. Like yeah. that's that's where I come from. Yeah, and I grew up in a family without music. Um, <laughs> no, no, but my parents don't work with music at all. Uh, I like no one in my family plays anything. But I was really into like music and uh, started like DJing for some like when I was really really young because it sounded fun, and I got hooked on like producing and I, as you I've been to like many music schools like all my education has basically been in music. Yeah. As you like we'd come to the same school in different areas of Sweden and then we met up in like our last music school yeah. <laughs> together. Yeah. That's so cool. I guess for Jonathan, um, since you grew up as a musician, what made you decide to go on the producing route instead of playing trumpet or drums? Uh, to be completely honest, like I was playing in a couple of bands, but I got so frustrated with having all the members in the band not playing what I wanted them to play. And, I'm, and I, I was the drummer. So that was just yeah. like an escape from the whole band thing because then you have to work together people like of course as a songwriter you have to work with people as well but well, at the same time I, I could play all the instruments at the same time like that was the kind of compromise I was trying to solve like I, I was trying to do everything myself basically. Yeah. I, I realized I couldn't be the best drummer and then I decided to become best at something else. Respect! Would you say, uh, Ludwig, that was it just after DJing that you realized, you know what, actually I love creation of music and beats? Is that when you decided that you wanted to go down this route? Yeah, kind of. Like, I, I DJ tried to... I really loved, like, the software and the technicality of producing music. So I got, I got really good at, like, producing very early. But, like, <laughs> inverted from Jonathan, I didn't know how to write music. I didn't have any real musical background. So... Instead of learning to produce, I guess, I had to learn like music and music theory and harmonies and all that other stuff. I'm still shit at playing almost every instrument, but like I know music. Yeah, a follow up question to that. A lot of fans are wondering, do you guys think it's important that all music producers have a form of music education? Is it important they know music theory? Is it important that they know programs like Logic Pro and Pro Tools and all that stuff? Like at some at some level, you you. It, it really helps to know about music theory while at the same time you don't have to go to a university in order to learn about like advanced music theory even if you do k-pop like we know the basic stuff and we've been touching the more advanced type of of the music theory while at the same time when we write music we don't really apply the music yeah. theory to okay. it we go more by ear and i guess like you can teach yourself like hearing different notes or di hearing different chords even without really knowing the theory yeah. behind it the music side is one thing, and it helps if someone can teach that to you. I I would say it's hard mm. to learn by yourself. Uh, but just like producing, when we grew up, when we started producing, you actually had to read like the manual, like a handbook printed. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Oh, interesting. And I mean, we we both been like production teachers in the past, used to like make a living, and I would say like today you don't. It helps if you have the money to spend or like the time, and it's what you really want. Sure, do it, but. It's so easy to learn how to produce with just the internet. Like, if you go into YouTube, you can learn how to produce music. It's so easy to do it nowadays compared to, like, back in the days. Yeah. And we still do, like, we still go, I go into YouTube every week and just be like, oh, I wonder if you can do this. I wonder if, like, 
can he apply this to something is to learn new stuff it's super fun and it's easy yeah so like you can right. educate yourself and, it, and uh -huh. it's, it's also important in order to you know learn new techniques and stuff like that because like as, as everyone knows like music just keeps on evolving and and you have to stay up to date in order to remain accurate yeah just fresh yeah what's an example of a modern technique that people should know how to flip a 808 in hundred different ways. <laughs> like, like the, 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 there's so many different like small tips and tricks, but especially like now when when trap has been become the, the next big thing all over the world, that is one technicality that is kind of like it's it's not hard to master, but it's just different in order to like yeah if, if you're doing a funk song that's way different compared to a trap beat or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it's just different tips and tricks on how you either should mix it or how you should program it or how you should just think when it comes to like the whole soundscape of, yeah. of, of those genres. Yeah. And if we're talking about K-pop, vocals is so important. And that's one of the toughest things to actually master, just how to record vocals so they sound good, arranging them, but also yeah. like mixing them. It's a nightmare. It's like, because it's so many members and yeah. so much vocals and harmonies and dubs, like it's really hard. You like, yeah, really have to learn and teach yourself how to do it properly. Yeah, it takes a long time. Right. I'd, I'd I'd say that the most important thing in most music, but especially K-pop, since like K-pop is vocals basically. It's just like a huge vocal arrangement and it's a huge vocal production. Even when we do the demos, they basically have to sound finished. Right, so we put in a lot of time and a lot of effort in into actually pull that kind of sound off, and you just do that with many vocals, different things that are going like going on under the lead melody and all that stuff, right? And that's the most important thing. Like you could write a super like shitty track, but as long as you have super luxurious like sounding vocals, it will still sound so expensive. If you get what I mean. At the same time, if you have a production that sounds awesome, but vocals that sounds like shit, then it's everything is just going to doesn't work. Yeah, no, it's going to sound like shit. <laughs> I agree, and that leads me to my next question: What is your role as songwriters? Are you guys the track makers or top liners or a mixture of both? Mm, mostly producers, but of course, uh, like we write a lot too. But we always have other people in the room to write, like our role is to do the track and the production and everything, but like Jonathan is a master on harmonies. We write a lot of like, sometimes I help a bit with the lyrics, like it's a song, everything has to click. So we write definitely, but we're not the, ma the main force behind it. Like uh, we work a lot with two girls here in Stockholm called Cassiopeia and Ellen Berg, who's amazing. And usually we work with them and they like, sit in the back and they like come up with a lot of the concepts and the lyrics and like the melodies and we're more like a filter that can kind of like yeah we like that can you twist that can you do it like this and they, they're the same with our and like with the track they can be like oh can we add an instrument like this or so do it like that like it's a col collaboration right so everything is happening at the same time have is this all happening in your studio in sweden or do you often go to korea for the songwriting camps yeah we work a lot here in sweden of course but uh, we we go to korea like once every five, fifth through five or six month, months. Like like tw <laughs> twice a year. Yeah, twice a year. And then we go go to different places and we go to Norway and we go to Bangkok and we travel a lot. Yeah. And then when you are writing songs, do you often get the concept first to then write the song about? Or do you tend to write songs and then the companies are like, you know what, this is good for this group and this specific concept? There are two different ways like it usually plays out. Either we get a brief from a certain company that says like, hi, we're looking for this type of song. We need this amount of parts. We need it to be a mix of this genre and this genre. And then we do that, uh, try to replicate like what they're suggesting in the brief. Uh, but on the other side, like most songs that have become different just like different from like doing a stereotypical pop song has come from us just being in the studio and just doing a song where Ooh. for example we we had the song uh, power up for example and i think it was casio yeah. that dropped oh yeah it would have been so cool if you could have made a song that just sounds like you're just inside of a big arcade machine 
right? So that was what we did basically. Yeah, and like you, so like usually we come up with the concepts. Like the companies don't usually have concepts, and like with the titles and stuff, sometimes oh. they. Usually, like the only part of the song they keep is the actual hook. Like, like a lot of the our songs, like we came up, the song was called the same thing when we did the demo, and they based the like the song or the music video or the album around that song. Sometimes Whoa. it can be more like, oh, we want to do a theme album. We wanted to have this vibe. Like, then it can be more like, oh, we have this concept, and then you have to find out songs in that concept, but. Usually we come up with it. Yeah. Yeah. Like they don't give it to yeah. you. I was wondering if Drippin or Bacon and Loco's Young were a, was a brief or you guys came up with those concepts. Drippin we came up with. Uh, yeah, like concept wise we came up with Drippin, but I think Drippin was based on a brief because we did that one on SM. Yeah, yeah. But the concept we came up with, yeah, but yeah. like it was based on a brief. And Young was just like a fun day in the studio, I guess. And that song wasn't actually called... That was one of the songs they actually translated. It wasn't called Young in the beginning. I don't want to say what it was called in the beginning, but it was very contemporary, I think. And they released it like one and a half or two years after the fact that like that we wrote it. So like I think the hook was kind of dated, like the word was kind of old at the time they released it. So they changed it, which was fine. Interesting. When you guys are writing those songs, do you also write the lyrics around it? Because I feel like the music with Drippin is so flowy like water and Young is so circular, like trying to not, like trying to break out of that uh, being stuck in a cycle. So I was thinking, if, did you have the lyrics beforehand or did you come up with the lyrics while writing the song or what was the order of that? And when it comes to the concepts for those two specific songs, I think it was the top lines, right? Yeah, I'm yeah. sure. But also, like, the lyrics, to be honest, is usually the last thing you do. Because we usually, not always, but usually we prepare a track. So we have, like, the track, and that's almost done. And then okay. you start, like, writing melodies, and we have, uh, whatever, like, we have a hand mic, and we're just recording melodies, and, you know, you add it and sharp and try to figure it out. Mm. And when you're, like, starting to set the melodies, then you start to write the lyrics. So it's kind of, like, the last thing you do. So the melody comes before the actual lyrics, especially for K-pop, because the lyrics are going to be translated anyways. So it's more important to have a great melody than to have a great... Like, the hook has to be good, but what word you use in the rap on the second verse isn't that important, since they're going to translate it anyway. Yeah, that makes sense. I was always wondering if you guys thought a lot about text painting while writing, but it's the other way around. It's the lyrics written to the sound of the song. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. But it, and then like with dripping, we like you usually have to if it's like, like concepts are so fun. We love to do concept songs. So with dripping, it's like the track didn't have those water flowing elements. We had a track, but we didn't have the water elements. And then we wrote it, and it was called dripping. And we we're like, oh, cool. Let's just add like the dripping noises and like other things, like the plop in the beginning, that's added like after the fact. Yeah. Who is the tongue clicker in dripping? Yeah, I think that's me. <laughs> I think that's you as well. It's in one of our sample, like we do sample packs, like once a year we sit in the studio one day and record ourselves doing weird shit. So we're usually in the songs in some way or another, just, yeah. just like with tongue clicks and claps and weird stuff. That is just mind blowing from my end. And going back to Power Up, so I saw what you posted on Instagram where Kazio Opea said was like singing harmonies on top of your track. I always imagined harmony writing to be just on sheet music and like playing around on the keyboard and filling out the harmonies, but it's so much of it is just done with voice, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, almost always. Like it's, I think maybe like once we've been trying to do that with the piano since Young. like the, yeah. Yeah. In the middle for young, like we had these really weird chords and we just wanted the chords in vocal. So then we just took the actual chord and be like, sing this, 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 this. But usually it's just, it tends to be kind of flat when you do it with keyboard as well, I think. Yeah. Like when you can do it by voice, like as you usually do it, just like you're really the harmony guy, but like just getting those weird drifts and you can like overlap and transition and it has to work with the words and everything. Yeah. Like you can do really fun stuff if you just do it by ear. Yeah, like a very common practice that is used in K-pop in general is that you do padding, right? So you, so you basically build like a pad, while in the end of the pad you actually jump onto the lyrics of the lead vocal, right? And 
that couldn't really be done if you just wrote it on, on sheet paper. Uh, I, I think it would be harder at least because there's so small nuances that you actually have to maybe follow the whale of the lead and, and then jump on to certain words or whatever. Like that's kind of a complex thing that, that we just do on the fly. We, we just try it out till, till it sounds cool. And I mean, we end up scrapping a lot of harmonies when we record vocals, like we're in vocals, yeah. it's like a six hour process usually. Yeah. And like, you have to try like 100 to get 50, almost, not really, yeah. but like you have to scrap a lot. And when you start okay. stacking, it's like you do three voices. And then when on the fourth voice, it's like, oh shit, this doesn't work. Yeah. Let's switch it out and stuff. Yeah. But sometimes it does. Yes, yeah. so sometimes it definitely does. And, and then you're in luck. But if, if you're out of luck, then, then you have recorded a full chorus and tried to like emphasize different words and it, it ends up just being flat. It doesn't really contribute anything to it. So sometimes you want to have like maybe sub melody going under the lead or something like that in order to add some flow to the top line as well. But yeah, you know, it's it's different from case to case. So you just have to be like ready to try out different stuff. And hopefully you have a vocalist that actually can endure us putting them into <laughs> into work. Wow. And that kind of goes back to, I have a follow-up question about the collaboration. Do you two work on the track together and then the top liners come in afterwards or you're all just creating at the same exact time in the same room? Uh, it's so different from time to time. Like a lot of times we have tracks prepared. Like we do that a lot. If we have a day without anything to do, we do a track. And when we go to like, when we travel, we always bring tracks to make it easier. But sometimes we just want to do everything from scratch and then everybody's in the room and that can be really interesting as well. Used to, if the actual top line has a really great concept, like with Power Up, you can be like, oh shit, like arcade machine, let's go. And let's like start searching for Game Boy sounds. Like that wouldn't have, we would never made that track if we didn't have the concept already. But sometimes you have a track, sometimes you just have an uh, ID. Yeah. But of course, we spend a lot of time just the two of us actually producing the music. I mean, writing a song takes a day. Writing a song and producing it and mixing it and everything, that takes two days. So if we're with top liners, that's one of the days. Another day is just spent on us producing it and making it sound good and everything like that. Yeah. So you guys mix your own stuff too? Like the demos. Uh, uh -huh. And SM of, course oh, okay. have, SM, of course, have engineers, but we send them finished mixing stems and usually I think it sounds very close to how our mix sounded so that's uh, like for us that's really good yeah and there's always uh, like there's also been s some cases where we've done a super like weird kind of effect that's very hard for them to replicate just by listening so then we've got files back sent to us and then we've processed it, processed it like the same way we did so it's Usually it's it's the company that stands for the recording of the artists themselves and mm. editing and mixing because they have people for those things. Oh, okay. I didn't realize how lengthy the process was because basically the demo is like almost a finished song. You send it to them, sometimes they use it and then they add whatever they want on top of that mixing wise. Yeah. Yeah. But like uh, the mixing also is really important. So it's kind of a guide for them as well. That's why mixing is important. Yeah. So like if you mm -hmm. mix the vocals and put the harmonies in a certain way or like with the track, it's good to mix it that as you want it yourself. So you, then it usually comes out the same way, which is good. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, a, it's yeah. a balance. Like if you have the chord super high in the production, mm -hmm. then you can't have the harmonies super high either. So, so you always have to balance that. And if we would just send without a mix, then they wouldn't really know if the chords are supposed to be the high parts or like the, the loud parts, uh -huh. or if it should, if it's supposed to be like the harmonies. So yeah. that's why like our mix is uh, quite different. Like it, it's a very important part of the whole process in just to yeah. kind of show our vision of how we think it yeah. should sound. Right, and so that leads me to asking, There's is there a sax in Peekaboo's third chorus or some synth that is super, super quiet? Was that your choice to have it super quiet in the back or was that an SM mixing decision? I, I think you're thinking of like, we put in a brass section in order to... <laughs> Da, da, da. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's yeah. That's that's a that's a plugin of. It's not only sax. It's it's trombone and trumpet as well. I think. Uh, it's like a 
four piece yeah. brass section. And and we just put it in just to actually just add something more to the Faking last it chorus. Out a little bit. Yeah, and try to not make it sound just as the other choruses, right? Yeah. So just add some more energy to it. But it could be that they lowered. I don't remember. Like it could be our mix that sound like that, or like it could be lowered. Yeah. I, I don't remember, but. Like they, the engineer, at especially SM, like everywhere, but especially at SM, are really good. Like they make su stuff sound amazing. Mm. So even if we, like even with a good mix, they those guys really know how to make it sound like super good. Just like those little things, and I mean they have crazy good engineers. Yeah. So it's really fun. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Yeah. No, it was interesting because I didn't notice that line until I bought the instrumental version. And then I realized this is so quiet in the mix. I wonder if it's like peekaboo. It's like, it's, you know, it's like hiding in the mix or something. I didn't even know there was an <laughs> instrumental version. Yeah. <laughs> is it the karaoke yeah, version yeah. with the flute on top or is it just the instrumental? It's just instrumental. Oh, that's awesome. We need to get that. <laughs> <laughs> it's on their um, Bad Boy Repackage album. Ah, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so now you know. Oh yeah, so I read your Balloon Day interview and you talked about you often make sounds to use in your songs from scratch and obviously you've said that you did that with the strings and Wavy. Other than Wavy's string part, what are some other examples that you made from scratch? We, we have, for example, the, the main pluck, the main melody of Peekaboo is a patch we made from scratch. So that's just like a synth called Serum, which we used in order to just make certain presets that we that we think would be good to use during sessions and and songwriting camps mm -hmm. and stuff like that so that for example is a quite upfront just like our own made sound people are like asking oh which synth is it but it's it doesn't really matter which synth it is it's more like of a preset and, and we made the preset ourselves are yeah you... i think like the wave strings like it's not entirely made from scratch it's like sampled and shopped and processed and fixed and done <laughs> yeah it's just a lot of stuff going on we just don't like a lot of producers use like uh, splice is a very famous like you can just download like whole loops and stuff and what's super bad about Splice is just like, we when we go to camp sometimes, it's like, I think Splice is like a top list. And you hear like 10 songs and it's like, oh, is that the same drum as it was in the last song? Like the same Hyatt loop? And it's like, oh yeah, it is. Like yeah. we would never use it ourselves in another song. For us, it's like, yeah, we did it okay. in that song. Like, let's put that in the back and don't use it again. Next question. What is your favorite part of a song to write in the structure? Pre-chorus, chorus, verse, bridge? Mm, I think it's very, as, as everything, it's very dependent from song to song. We have <laughs> some parts that like you like the most or I like the most mm. of, of every each song we do. Well, at the same time, I think we, we're all always about like big choruses. Even if it's a drop or if it's just a super funky song, we we really yeah. focus on the chorus as having like a real impact. Like had we've done very few songs with like anti-choruses or whatever that you just drop down and there's no energy in it. Like we we kind of addicted to just make it bang as soon as, as the chorus comes. Yeah. I, I love post hooks. Like I love it when we have a great chorus and then it's like on top of that, let's do this. And it's like a little bit better almost. Yeah. We did a song for Red Velvet called Boomerang that has like a post chorus. It's only the last chorus, it has the post chorus. But it's like. It's, it's called Sassy Me, but now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, 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 but oh, now you know. okay. I was like, uh, okay, I just <laughs> want to go along with this. Sassy I don't know Boomerang, oh, yeah. but. It's not called Boomerang, it's called Sassy Me. That's right. But now you know that. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, that, so that was the first name for it. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. No, but like the last chorus, they have like, it's a super cool, like just extra hook. I just think that's great when they have like a nice chorus and it's like a post hook. It's like, whoa, shit. Yeah. It's, it <laughs> almost acts like an outro. You know, that whole thing. It sounds so standard just having three choruses and that's it. We, we need to have something extra. So we put that in and that made the extra little... You know. Okay, when you have a post chorus, do you think it's important that the catchy hooks comes in the post chorus or the chorus itself? <laughs> to, to, I think both parts has to be super oh. hooky. It's more like when you've come to the end of the chorus, then you just expect it to end, but no, there's more, right? That's the yeah. kind of effect we want to yeah. 
achieve. So yeah, if we're gonna get like super technical, like for us, it's like the the title of the song has to be like the you have it's have have to be obvious what the title of the song is. So like when we talk about it, we like post like A chorus and B chorus. Sometimes if you have an A chorus and a B chorus, you, we usually put a tag in between. So like the tag is just like the usually a very strongly harmonized section that's supposed to like catch your ear. That you can put like in the end of the A chorus if you only do the A chorus or the end of the B chorus or both used to be like, oh, that's the title of the song. Da 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 power up da 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 like da 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 yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. So that, that's that's like a tag. So we put that in just so we can use it both in the A and the B because it was weird to like not have the title in both parts. That kind of leads to my next question because you talked about you like having your courses hit hard with many layers. How do you know when you've had enough layers because when you don't, maybe if you don't have the vocals in yet, how do you know whether it's going to become like too busy or too muddy? Like what's the limit? <laughs> <laughs> like that's the thing. Like we come from, we both come from very electronic kinds of music and then you just overproduce the shit out of the song so <laughs> so when we do tracks it, it quite often it's too many layers and we never really take those layers away we just like lower it super super low and that i think that actually adds so much to kind of the three dimension of of the whole mix so if you listen closely, you can hear like the brass section in the last chorus of Peekaboo. Like that that's, has to be one of those examples where we've just put in too much stuff and we just have to kind of, you know, sort it out and kind of make it more, yeah. more simple. Is uh, You learn it after a while as well. In the beginning, especially working, like working with tracks and actually writing after you've done the track. In the beginning, our tracks were very busy. Because it can be produced in a way that it sounds really big, but it can also be very produced in a way that's very busy, like a lot of stuff happening, so you don't have you don't have space for vocals. But you learn sure. when you do it, like when you do it a few times, you learn like, okay, this is gonna take over too much and like this is gonna grab attention in the wrong way. So you like you learn to mellow it down a bit and make some space right. for the vocals. Yeah. Smart. So it's all about just mixing and dynamics, I guess. After you're like, yeah, this is a good track. Okay, <laughs> let's just psh, and then vocals on top. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. exactly. Cool. Okay. Moving on to actually a fan question uh, on Twitter: Sunshine or Storm wonders what's the main difference between writing songs for Red Velvet and Twice, or in another word, writing for SM versus other companies? Is there a specific sound each company wants? It's not that different, like the workflow is usually the same, but the bands are different and like you have to really, uh, you have to know which band you're writing for and like try to make it into that band. Like of course Red Velvet have five? Five. Five members. Five. For us it's like, if we write for Red Velvet, we have to put in a great ad lib for Windy to do in the last chorus. Like, you know that she's gonna do that so you can all, like you can write it for her, if you know what I mean. And if you work for, yeah exactly, yeah. and if you work for like, Twice, you know that there's a lot more girls and you have to do it different and have different sounds. But also, like, you have to give the bands a lot of credit because sometimes you just write a song you don't really think. It's like, oh, it's a girl song. It's a K-pop girl song. But it's not like, okay. oh, this is a Twice, it's a Red Velvet. And when the band actually takes it and, like, record the vocals, it instantly become, becomes like a Twice or Red Velvet song just because it's their vocals and, like, they have flavor. Like, especially Red Velvet have, like, amazing... Like they add so much flavor with the, with their voices and expression. Even if they mimic the demo, it's like still, yeah. It's still really them good. doing the song. Like it's, yeah. it's it's not them just trying to do like a cover of the original demo. But at the same mm -hmm. time, it's more of if we're writing towards a specific band, we have to kind of know what vocal range they have, at, as well as knowing how many rappers are in the band, if there are any. Because it would be mm -hmm. kind of weird to to write the a big rap section if, if a certain, you know, band or act doesn't have any rappers. I was wondering, was Moonwalk created and then sent to Adrian McKinnon or were you guys working together for that? No, that, that's a weird one. We, we sent a track to SM that sent it to Adrian. Okay, because I, I was wondering because one of the members hit such a high note. So I was going to ask, do, does SM 
give composers like this member has this range or do you just have to listen to past music and hope that they can hit high notes uh i think in most scenarios they have a, a vocal director that actually knows their range and know what kind of vocal style they use and they utilize that in the best way possible by you know assigning them certain parts so the whole you know like we've seen there are certain videos of line distribution uh, for every song that's released just to see who got the most attention but i don't really think that's the oh. main focus i think the the line distribution uh -huh. is just based on which uh, like whose vocal tone fits which part the best yeah. and for some songs yeah. someone can get super much attention just by having like all the verses or whatever like or, or, or being the only one doing all the raps but i think that's just like a preference of what sounds best for the song's sake not for who is the most important right that's interesting okay moving on to our very last question what would you guys say is unique to your sound as producers? Is it, I've noticed that you've done a ton of major minor progressions or just mixing genres up or using, you know, those self-made samples. What do you think makes Moonshine, Moonshine? I think it, it's of course a combination of, of different, like a lot, lots of different stuff, but I think it's first and foremost, like we're nerds. So we spend so much time putting into like the productions. We really want the productions to have like a couple of elements that actually are you know unique or sound like something you've never heard before as well as like we told you before with the whole you know we have too many layers and we don't take them away we just lower them and therefore we get more like of a three dynamic like 3d kind of soundscape to to the tracks yeah when we listen to music like the most fun music to listen to is the one that you hear and it's like how the fuck did they do that? It's like, it's impossible to understand how it's made. And a big key of that is that like using unique sounds and also doing a lot of stuff. So it's like, it gets hard to know what is what and it's like gets a, a great blend. And we love that. We try to do that like ourselves. So I think that's a big part of it. Or like the Swedish water could be the thing as well. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm so grateful for you guys' music and you putting so much effort into having that busy I would like to say delicious table full of food uh, sound. So thank you so much for agreeing to do this interview. This was lots of fun. To wrap things up, do you want to say anything to people who like your music? Anything coming up? Any plans? Yeah, like we just want to thank all all the people that love our music or listen to our music or buy our music or go to the concerts. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do this if it weren't for the fans of all these bands and, and all the people that listen yeah. to what we do and appreciate what we do. We get so many fans actually reaching out to our, our Instagram just thanking us for writing songs for their yeah. favorite act and that just lightens up our day and that gives us even more inspiration to do even better songs. Uh, yeah. I think that's like the most biggest part of this and and especially why k-pop is so encouraging is like we get so much inspiration for all the fans and seeing how people react to to uh, the music we do and yeah all that yeah it sounds super cheesy but it's kind of true it's like it's super nice just to get like we we don't like to be in the spotlight in that way but like with fans and people like well like when you guys react to our music it's so fun to see people like just analyzing it was like oh i like that oh that's weird like even even when people say like not bad stuff but like oh i don't like it it's so nice and fun to see people be like oh shit that part didn't do it for them why and like you learn so much it's so fun yeah when we do european music that never happens like nobody knows who did it nobody cares it's just like bye but with k-pop it's like it's so much to dig into it's amazing like the one of the Funniest thing is, is actually hearing people trying to figure out whether the strings are real or fake. Or, for example, like the... I guess we can say that, like in, in uh, Dance the Night Away, like everyone's been thinking of like, is the, is the main lead synth, is that like a real trumpet or is that a synth? No, it's just a mouth trumpet. It's basically... Super distorted and tweaked, so like... Yeah. Everyone is trying to figure out how how that sound was achieved and nobody has gotten it right thus yeah. far. You learned it here first, folks. You learned it here. It's a mouth trumpet. 
Actually, a really quick follow-up question to that. Uh, a ranger on my channel is wondering, is the sax in Sassimi a real saxophone? Yeah, it yeah. is. It's a super chopped, like, real recording of a, of a saxophone. So, yeah, that's definitely real. Like, the basics of it, it's real, but it's, like, heavily processed. I think it's pitch automated as well. Yeah. Like, it's a really sad saxophone. <laughs> 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 it doesn't hit many notes. <laughs> well, we're so, so looking forward to what you have coming. And, again, thanks so much for appearing on my channel and answering all my questions. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so Thank much you for so having much. us. It's been so fun. Yeah.